Here we go. Good. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Neural Learning's very first event, a uh, new level of coherence, integrating evolution, uh, activism, mysticism, and new science. We're really excited to have you, James, here with us today, and we thank everyone for joining us tonight or tomorrow, whenever or wherever you're listening to this. Uh, Neuro's mission is to foster a culture of consciousness that celebrates education, learning that is transformational, reading the text of life, and self-authorship so that we might rewrite ourselves and the world anew. We aspire to a philosophical worldview that might bridge the oftentimes wide gaps between myth and science, mysticism and activism, and most of all, social transformation and spiritual calling. But cultures and countercultures have often, frequently, been agents of cultural change, evolution, and revolutions in consciousness. The early birds, like the artists who sensed a change in season before the rest of us and attempted to articulate that larger invisible transformation. So, here we are in just such a transformation. It moves around us and before us. It speaks in the changing of the weather and the rising tide of anxiety around climate change and political upheaval. It has arrived quietly, implicitly in our every breath and every text. We made Nora to help us become sensitive to that transformation in consciousness and to see if we could assist in whatever small way in preparing those who are also sensitive to these cultural changes to make some effort in themselves and their worlds, which is our shared world for the better. So we are joined today by James O'D. James O'D is the author of The Conscious Activist, Cultivating Peace, and most recently, The Soul Awakening Practice. James is a former president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, uh, the Washington Office Director of Amnesty International USA, and the CEO of SIVA Foundation. He worked with the Middle East Council of Churches in Beirut during a time of war and massacre and lived in Turkey for five years during civil upheaval and a coup. In Turkey, he survived a knife attack and gunfire into his apartment and in Lebanon escaped West Beirut during a temporary ceasefire. In his human right work, uh, human right works, he has met world leaders, testified before Congress, helped organize NGO participation in the World Conference on Human Rights, and engaged in human rights missions abroad. Uh, James has taught peace building to over uh, to thousands of students in 30 countries with the Shift Network, and he's also conducted frontline social healing dialogues around the world, and worked with peace builders in several of the world's hotspots. He is the founding member of the Evolutionary Leaders Group and on the advisory board for the Peace Alliance, Cosmos Journal, and the Laszlo New Paradigm Institute. And he currently resides in Crestone, Colorado. So welcome, James. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Great to be with you. So I suppose we could get started. I know you wanted to kind of um, do a little opening space creation, right? A little invocation. So if you wanted to uh, take the mic and lead us into that and through that um, would be most, most gracious. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I thought I would just invoke some resonance and the resonance that we're headed into together. And I, I want to use the opening lines of the Aramaic version of our Lord's Prayer, that's the very opening, really, as a way in. And what you discover when it's translated into Aramaic, you discover a whole different world of contemplation. So the words of the, in English, the King James is, Our Father who art in heaven, become Abun de Boshamaya. Nes Kadesh Shamak. Abun is not father, it's mother father, it's genderless, it's creator, it's originator. Abun de Bushamaya, to the place, here we have this abstract word heaven. Bashamaya is a place of the Shem, of the resonances, of the frequencies of high resonant sound and light, all the home of all the frequencies coming into harmony through the cosmos. Abun de Bashamaya, Nes Kadesh Shemak, beam back that Shem, that frequency into me. Abun de Bashamaya, Nes Kadesh Shemak, O mother, father of the cosmos, 
of light and sound and all the radiant frequencies of the universe. Let us be in resonance as cosmic beings with that frequency and the source of that frequency. Let us together tonight come into resonance with those frequencies that our resonance may be felt in the larger field of human experience. Thank you for that. Opening invocation. Thank you for that. Uh, wonderful. So, so um, to kind of begin, there are many different ways, I guess, we could approach the topic tonight. But so, um, evolution, evolutionary mysticism is a word that we kind of toss around a lot in in our circles in our community. Uh, but you know, the d idea is that um, we are we have the potential to change or transform and we can kind of participate in that sort of creative act on the earth with the rest of life in culture and consciousness. Um, and that's sort of been one of like the very powerful messages in the human potential movement and the consciousness culture. But in your work as well, you've, you've applied that not only to this kind of inner process, uh, but to sort of say, okay, how do we do this in the world? What, how do we do this socially? So maybe we could begin by sort of looking at that dynamic between, between uh, the sort of mystical aspect of, of transformation and the political or social, dare we say, social aspect of transformation, because the two go hand in hand. Uh, and I would love for you to kind of express uh, your, your experience with that, with that kind of engagement and friction there. Right. Uh, if I may step back for a moment and try to get a map that might work so that we could speak from a, a map that is about this new coherence that I think is emerging. And in evolutionary process, we have something that is becoming clearer to more people, which is that you have two things going on, really. You have the e, that E word at the beginning, evolvo turning out, E is always the exit, the outward. So e evolution, the, the turning out, the evolving into space and time and shape and form and unfolding in the material plane. And the journey itself is quite spectacular <laughs> through all those forms to the current human form and the quest to have all the forms of evolutionary process again come into some level of harmony and resonance, resonance rather than brutal friction and, and unsustainability and disharmony in nature. And I hope we'll talk a little bit more about nature in, in a while. But the other word that is necessary is involution. And in is involvo is to turn inward. And so what we experience is that consciousness seems to reach a point, a fulcrum, and then it begins to shift its axis inward and to begin to question who am i where do i come from what have all these lifetimes been about what is this journey and there's that quest for inner experience and you know when you put that those words together evolutionary mysticism you know my heart sings because it is a marker for the place in human experience where many souls, great souls, over the ages have taken that journey in and 
mysticism is centrally ab about direct experience. It's about going into the inner and experiencing something, not making it up, not fantasizing about it, but actually raw, deep, noble experience that can be shared and agreed upon by others, that, that is valid, that it is true, that it is revelatory, that it tells us about something about the nature of the whole process. So that first map <laughs> that says, there's a game here, there's a process here, and it is about consciousness entering into matter at the most constricted forms of matter and taking a journey through matter, through the gases, through the rocks, through the worms and the wigglies, through the birds, through the animals, through many, many lifetimes of human experience as consciousness oscillates between these different vegetable and animal and mineral forms and begins to see what is being revealed in the human experience. And so, you know, one important thing in this map of coherence and worldview clarity is that you cannot go through lifetimes as a saint. It doesn't work. You cannot go through lifetimes without experiencing the man in you, the woman in you, the, the greedy one, the saintly one, the, all the different forms, because consciousness itself starts to know what is the center of truth, where your real essence of being is by experimenting in this way and experiencing it. So we have consciousness entering into matter, going into these experiences, and then reaching a particular lifetime in which that in Volvo begins. I mean, it really begins for real. And you enter the planes, that you travel through the planes of consciousness, the subtle planes of consciousness, the higher mental plane, the places in consciousness where there is no energy at all, but pure insight. And you journey into those places. And what is particularly exciting to me in a conversation like this with you is that we can then say, how do we hold the two? What is the integral map that says, wait, wait a minute, you're not just trying to get off planet Earth, are you? you know, you're not just locking the door on the world and finding your spiritual path and spending all your money and every effort you can to go off into some other realm, but that there is some mystery itself that as we deepen, we affect the field. So the life of the contemplative is one that is pulsing contemplative being into the collective field. But also there's a place for the activist, for the actor, for the participant to say, we need to affect the reality with organizational skills, with practical ideologies, with community involvement, with coming together to bring what that wisdom is and that knowledge of the inner planes is. So maybe I'll pause for a moment and just get your response to that general map. Uh, I have responses, complete resonance and agreement. Um, you know, as, as uh, I was hearing you describe that, I was, I was thinking about uh, Sri Aurobindo, the, the Indian yogi 
and uh, scholar and how he described the psychic being right as this this sort of aspect of our soul that that learns through the lifetimes and gains experience and sort of takes eventually it takes up the the incarnation the person and starts to come to the forefront of that person and act in the world um so in terms of my own kind of resonance and understanding that 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 makes complete sense and um i guess that's sort of the question um i've always kind of held which is you know when you begin to kind of contemplate that deep time perspective that we are not only perhaps incarnating through lifetimes, but, but extending beyond the species itself. And, you know, we are kind of the, the life of, of the whole earth, you know, the dreaming of the earth. How, what do we do with that? How do we act in the world with that kind of um, profound information, that profound insight? Yes, indeed. But first of all, we have to deal with that, first part that you were focusing on, which is, who are we in nature? What is our identity? And the, the, we, we can't sort of find our way through the conflict until we know the truth of who we are. And the truth of who we are is that we are nature. We have come through all of these processes. The soul has journeyed through the evolutionary process. Our DNA is a library of this story. You know, 50% of our DNA is shared with a banana. And we are truly a part of the whole. And so we when we come to that consciousness, we, we know in a different way then how we can be the voice of nature. How, because it's not nature as abstracted from us, but nature speaking beautifully, powerfully through us. Let me share a poem uh, from a friend of mine here in Crestone, Colorado. Sure, please do. Sunlight through the lilac leaves dapples the side of my neighbor's barn, and the air is cool this morning as the magpie journeys through. Don't you wish you could be the sunlight dappling the barn? Don't you wish you could be the air caught in the wings of the sudden bird? Be still. Listen. Something will tell you, something inside you already knows. The sunlit face of all your cells are dappling the barn. The rhythmic beating inside your breast is the windy wings of the blackbird. You can live this way. In fact, you were born to release your fears from their little cages. The time has come to receive the ghost. And I think what you, and the ghost at the end, of course, is that abstraction. That, you know, when we inhabit ourselves as that intersubjective reality, not some distorted subject, object, nature is an object and you cut it down and you farm it and you have this, you know, distant relationship. You are the voice. You can be, as she says so beautifully in that poem, you can be that voice. So that takes us, doesn't it, really, to another place when if we have made that mental, emotional, spiritual shift to say, it is my responsibility to resonate with the field of nature, to feel the nature being in me, and to help my community organize to maximize the fruitful resonance with that natural being, to learn from its wisdom and to share 
our te techniques, our skills, our savvy, our know-how. I mean, we have lots of that creative stuff that we can interact with nature in a technological way that is resonant and beautiful and powerful. Doesn't mean we have to abandon technology. We have to redesign where necessary our technologies to make that resonance. And then, then I think we are really in a prime place to feel those spiritual dimensions in nature, to begin to feel the subtle planes and to take that journey deeper and deeper, not by abandoning and turning our backs on nature, but by letting it sing, letting it resonate through us. Beautiful, thank you. Um... So that sort of leads me to a question of um, how to do that. What the first, the first kind of engagement is to how to get in tune with those subtle fields. What kind of practices or techniques or maybe simply orientations would you encourage participants and listeners to really kind of engage with nature and th with their nature in that way? There is one thought by Mayor Baba, who has been a great inspiration to me, and I'm so glad you also mentioned Sri Aurobindo. But he says, really, when consciousness arrives in the human form, it is complete. You don't add to your consciousness. What you have to do is then begin to pull away all the parts of you that are maybe blind instinct as opposed to insightful instinct. And then you enter lifetimes where you bounce around and, and get this karma stuff. And you have to... So the central process is are in loosening the binds of impression and condition, things that will help you see reality for what it is. Because you, you don't have to build yourself up. I think that's a wonderful insight. You have the consciousness, we all do, every human being. There is no, no contest here. But we have different kinds of experiences that block us, that close us off, that blind us. And so part of it is, you know, how then do we decondition? And, you know, for some that requires moving away a little to get space and to get perception and to get you know, perspective. For others, it is about going in and experiencing more truth, more justice, more transformation. But so I'm not the best person to ask about practices per se. But I will say, it's about polishing the heart. It's about polishing the eye of the heart and the eye of the mind and bringing them together. And so whatever practices is build your self-awareness or experiences. I love to tell people, you know, that when I was 13, I, I was a criminal on the run. I, I was in a boarding school in England that was about, you know, a spiritual journey. I really thought I was called to the priesthood. It was an intense couple of years and beautiful couple of years. But the demon <laughs> entered me and I robbed the 
school safe and ran away. And I experienced the fall, that sense of loss, of deep spiritual loss, and that I had created some karma for myself. I had made it more difficult. And I think that's so precious in life when we fall, you know, I put it in parentheses, really, because it's, it's just our own way of acting through to learn. And in my case, after a couple of years in London where my family were living, I turned my energy and focus into activism, into social change. I organized young people to go to poor neighborhoods of London and you know, document the services they were not receiving and working with senior civil servants, senior citizens. And for that work, you know, which was rewarding in its own way, I was given the Teenager of the Year Award. And, you know, I really felt, wow, change is possible. We can really mobilize, you know, people of any age have conscience. And it was a real sense of the instrumentality of that activism that I still believe in. And then the Minister for Social Welfare wrote to me and asked, he said, it seems you're getting a lot of attention and you have some criticism of our government's treatment of senior citizens. Would you please come in and discuss these matters with me? And there, there it is in my response. You know, I wrote back and said, you know what you need to do and when you do it, we can meet. You know, the adolescent in me refusing dialogue, refusing to have the power to sit with that which you are opposed to. It was easier, safer to say, you're the enemy, you're the bad guys, we're the good guys, just go do what you're supposed to do. And of course, you see that in unconscious activism. You see that as not fully developed activism. And so for me, the practice has been from that early age is to watch out for my finger pointing you know, disposition, for my arrogance. I mean, what is the practice that I'm sure a number of our participants here this evening may have a, an answer for what is the practice that gets uproots arrogance and distances another. You know, in that Aramaic Jesus that I was speaking to, it's a book by Neil Douglas Cross called The Prayers of the Cosmos, and he talks about a kind of deeper understanding of love thy enemy, that the esoteric practice, love thy enemy, is to go in an unannounced esoteric way into the heart of the one you perceive as the enemy and find the place in them that you know as a human being you can resonate with. Every human being has that place. And so love thy enemy means, you know, as you are oriented to enemy eyes, others, choose one, go secretly in prayer into the interior world and unite with them. Love them from within. Love them from the place where you know, as in Plotz's perception, you know, you're 
dealing with a force that's out of balance, that's bloated, that's coming at you, and you still do a little Aikido behind that energy and find the place where you can unite. And that is an esoteric practice that I think I would highly recommend. Thank you. That's really insightful. Um, and it's something that applies so much to what's going on right now, um, especially in, in the United States, but really all over the world. Um, we're in a time that just seems to be so splintered and fragmented. And it seems to be that we're having a lot of difficulty uh, communicating with one another without so much heat, so much, you know, no, no light, but tons of heat, no insight, but lots of friction. And I guess my question is what, why, what is it about this moment that we're having so many tensions and problems and, and folks in the U S are kind of calling it like, you know, we haven't been this divided since, you know, the civil war in terms of viewpoints. So what is it about, culture and consciousness right now what are those wounds what are those fractures and and certainly you're describing a way to kind of address that and step through it with a with a with a contemplative practice but um i guess my question is what what do you see as the source and origin of these wounds i know you speak about ancestral wounds and and, and generational trauma um so maybe it has something to do with that but uh, I think insight about what's going on right now and the kind of firestorm going on in, in media, no matter where you turn, would, would be very helpful for a, uh, a modern contemplative to navigate. Uh, thank you. Yes, there's a lot in that question, but the center of the wound is the other, and then the characterization of the other, the empowerment of the other, the danger of the other, the fear of the other, the castigation of the other. And you just, we bloat and puff up all the forms of the other, other until the other crowds out the we and the I. And so, in that puffed up of other, there is you, child, you should never speak to them. You know, there's then the transmission of that construct around the other, you know, sometimes very subtly conveyed in families, just very, very subtly, you know, the wound is sneaked under the carpet. You know, we don't talk about those things in that, in this house. You know, you're not one of them, are you? you know? and, and so we live in a world, I call it wound contagion, where wounds meet wounds, where the other is otherized in the self. In the heart of the self, you feel the presence of the other, a part of you that you can't forgive, or you repress, or you don't fully embrace. And, you know, that sense that the wound is very subtle at many levels of society and very deep and dangerous at other levels. We know that the un- healed wound is a danger zone, is a zone in which other wounds can come out of and form. That's why when we look at social process, as you were alluding to, and you think of you know, the stages of history where you just completely decimated anything that was the other, you know, and there was, there was no sense of justice to the beginnings of the formation of ethics and laws and governance. And you know, if you think of the leap up to after the Second World War, 
you know, in your however flawed they were, they were trials, they were legal processes. And out of that whole period, you know, a whole swath of enlightened law, universal declaration of human rights, covenant on civil and political rights, the rights of the child, the rights of women, the rights of minorities. And that sense then that we come to a, a place like South Africa and they've already worked out that the law is great, but unless you get inside the story, unless you get into the inner experience where the wound is hiding out, where the hurt and the pain and the agony is being felt, and you allow that story to be told, truth, reconciliation, forgiveness, you know, hearing the truth and coming through a difficult and challenging process to forgive, to release, to move on. What an evolutionary curve we've just described there that brings us in social process into the reality that there are facts and truths and there are facts and truths of experience and both must be deeply appreciated and weighed. Otherwise, the wound will hang out in hiding. You know, and as an Israeli friend of mine said, you know, the wound that we carry that is still unresolved leads to a shadow where we don't see how we are then wounding others, wounding the Palestinians. And that story is not just about Israel, but it's in many aspects of the world where then the wound creates a shadow effect. And so one of the practices in conscious social healing work is to look, what is the possible shadow in my culture? What are we projecting onto the world? If you take the United States, I mean, the dark, deep, dangerous shadow of being the world's number one by an extraordinary amount exporter of weapons of destruction, of death, of arms, and to have a military economy that's three times the size of any other advanced group of nations even. So there's you know, there's work that still needs to be done. But once that shadow is addressed, and you know, I've been involved in social healing processes. In fact, uh, we noted earlier, Belvi Rooks was on the call and Molly Leach. They've both done extraordinary work in the field of restorative justice, of healing processes and that our capacity to heal from the most outrageous suffering is real, is great. We are invited in, that, in this stage of evolutionary process to step into our roles as capacitated, courageous healers. The work that was done in Rwanda after the genocide there, and it's extraordinary work in Sierra Leone and in other places where communities come together with the intention of healing, of facing the wound, facing the pain, and, and then finding ways to move on with the knowledge that our heart's truth matters much more in the end and historical truths, but both truths matter. It seems that um, in the same way we have to be, try to be more sensitive to the consequences of what we're doing to the environment uh, in terms of global warming and, and ecology, to kind of see the world as this integrated living system. We have to see ourselves in that same sort of way, in terms of restorative justice or in terms of just being able to address 
these social wounds that linger across the generation, even if things are technically better, uh, you know, they, they, they can kind of flare up and we don't know where, where they're coming from because it seems like we're not really addressing that, what you're saying, this uh, kind of shadow, these wounds that are swept under the rug. So I'm just getting, um, just as a kind of observation and very, very kind of ecological analogies here. And I've never really thought of that or, or linked that exactly to, to human systems, to, to human culture, to human sort of social consciousness, but it seems like they're very linked, they're very connected. Yes, indeed. The wounds in nature are a reflection of our wounds. The state of the planet, its airs, its forests, its rivers, the whole challenge for survival, that is a pictorial graphic map of the human wound of disconnection, dislocation, dismemberment in terms of our being a part of nature. That's why that question of coherence is really, really important, that we find a map to reintegrate the whole so that we can experience spiritually the incredible inner journey through the planes of consciousness. We can also experience a relationship with Earth that is fruitful, that is just, that is sharing. And I, I found a wonderful book a few years ago. I think it's gone out of print, but it's called Understanding the Grand Design. And you, you were talking about systems I just want to read a few of his pointers here, again, to give us that coherent context that, you know, we are in what Kirstler called a holarchy, and the holarchy is made up of holons, and holons are things that are whole in themselves and a part of a greater whole. And when you think of nature, and civilization and those interactions between ourselves. You know, we are holons communicating with holons. So we're not part, there is nothing lesser, there is nothing inferior in the whole thing, not even a cockroach. There is nothing below me. There is nothing ontologically lesser and that sense of understanding that you are whole and complete in who you are, and you're a part, an interrelated, interdependent part of a greater system of wholes. But look at what he points out in these few pointers on wholeness. I think it'll give you fodder for another question there. The number of dimensions of the whole exceeds those of the individual parts. So that's pretty clear. The whole and its parts are one when viewed from the dimensional level of the whole. So when you're looking at the, from the perspective of the whole, the whole and its parts are one. If we could only, in as many ways as possible, look from the perspective of the whole, we would see how we are interrelated. We would have a new kind of respect for each other in ways that we can understand how the puzzle comes together. The whole is invisible from the lower dimensional level of its parts. So from the part, when the part is absorbed in being the part and functioning as the part, it is blind to the whole and acts like a little part doing its part. And I think culturally, Jeremy, you know, one of the things that I fear is happening is we have at one level an extraordinary spiritual revolution in process spiritual evolution. I mean, we are 
we have so much light below the radar screen, you wouldn't believe it. And that light and that energy and that creativity is going to burst forth. There is going to be a deep social shift. But countering that, that uh, the danger zone, is there is also more what I call pigeon brain. And pigeon brain is facilitated by you know, the technologies. The people sit behind their desks and go off into Google land and Facebook land and they nibble at data bytes, you know. Oh, oh yeah, you should Google about Akashic records. No man, you should Google about the Pleiades. And you, you so you, so you get a few, a few data bytes about the Pleiades, about this, about Zen, about you know, organic farming, whatever. But that sense of the picture of the wholeness can be compromised by thinking or believing that it's about data bytes, that it's about information, it's about knowledge, and it's about imagination, and it's about wisdom and wholeness and gathering perspective. So we need that spacious element that the data bytes, you know, the data crumbs we gather up. You'll never imagine what I just discovered on the internet. And there's so much of that. But that there is a spaciousness in consciousness that it touches the still point of the turning world that we have an inner life that doesn't you know, let every impression stick, but that the nature of the consciousness itself is one of non-stick. That's when we get subtler, and the subtler we get, the more powerful and deep and concentrated the consciousness becomes. So, as we get into that stage, the sometimes really fierce impressions that come can pass through us. But that's the core also of nonviolent communication. That's how we can translate moments of you know, anger, hostility, cynicism, violence into a communicative process, the social order really can digest nonviolent communication from childhood on and, and have a major impact on how we live. There's that story, I heard it on NPR, of a guy who used to every night get off at a subway station before his home because there was a diner he liked to go to. And when he got off, it was late at night, we'd have a late dinner. When he got off the station, it was very empty. And a young man with a big knife came at him and said, you know, give me your wallet. And he threw the wallet. And as the kid was running away, the man said, you know, I have a coat too. And I can afford to lose a coat, and it's a really cold night. So maybe you want to take my coat too. <laughs> and the young teenager stops and turns around. Dialogue has begun. You know, the essence of nonviolent communication is what do you need me to understand? And what can I share? of my essence, my true essence, with you. And in this story, when he talks to the kid, he says, and you're probably hungry, and I, I have this best diner in New York. You know, come, come with me and we'll have a feast. And he goes to the diner and they eat and 
you know, the teenager is getting what he really needs, interaction, warmth, compassion, energy. And, and the guy says to the teenager, I'd pay for dinner, but I recently lost my wallet. And the kid throws him back his wallet. And he says, you know, I have an idea. I have 50 bucks in my wallet. I'd like to buy your knife. Could I possibly do that? I mean, what skill we can bring into everyday life that can really transform the social order. But that sense, I'm sure you're feeling too, that I mentioned earlier of this incredible moment that somehow the melodrama of the political world, the chaos has gotten so transparent. You know, nobody's hiding their nonsense anymore. It's just all out, uh, it's all hanging out everywhere. And that seems to have catalyzed and sparked the latent field, you know, David Bohm talks about the implicate and the explicate order. And he says the implicate order is potently filled with latency for anything we want. We want to transform the world. We need to tap into that latent field. And it's happening. I have had a life where I have come through war and suffering and persecution and horror uh, and danger. But I've always had that sense, this is not the end of the story. There's another part of the story and I'm a part of that other part of the story. I have to live this part of the story with all my skill that I can. But I am essentially called into this time and era for the other part of the story, that, that music that can be heard in certain places, that evolutionary flowering of the inner and the outer, that those forms of community being where I am you and you are me, and who are they, the they we were talking about, their history. You know, it's an intersubjective, richly nurturing revolution, evolution that is sprouting all over the place. That that is a uh, a fantastic response to my wordy question. Thank you for unpacking it and 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 then some. And um and, and in many ways, you I asked myself questions and then you answered them. So I don't know if I have any questions, except maybe one before we get to Q&A. Uh, and that would be to simply um, link the final piece, make it a little bit more explicit in terms of this coherent worldview. Um, the, the science, uh, you know, we've been going very deep. You, you've mentioned uh, the importance of dialogue and really how we could transform our society now just from this insight. Um, if we really wanted to, but I know you've also mentioned in the past and in in your book as well, uh, Soul Awakening Practice, that there's there's science to, to that backs this up that resonates with this as well. So we don't only have the the mystical, the social, but also the scientific that's saying yes, go into this. This is what's actually going to work. We this is what um, you know improves um, you know our mental states. This is what opens us up to each other. So maybe you could speak a little about, maybe even just provide a few examples of the kind of science in this emerging coherent worldview. Absolutely, yes. And, and we sometimes call it new science. It's, it's, it's a science that we agree with in the sense that it matches, is beginning to match deep inner work and spiritual practice and those states that, and insights that evolve from that. When we see the science coming towards that, 
we say, you know, hallelujah. So, you know, the, the stepping into the quantum field was a beginning of science's journey into unity, wholeness, oneness, holarchies of completely interconnected reality that was more powerful beyond the solidity of matter itself. You know, that a hairpin has enough energy in it that it can blow cities apart. That, you know, we began to understand that, that there was a relationship between the quantum level and consciousness. That as we observed the activities of electrons, in the quantum field, we saw they were affected by whether or not somebody was observing them. How weird and wacky is that? And that has further led the forward edge of consciousness into the whole discussion about consciousness itself is the causal reality. And then you have science edging more and more into that. You have a neuroscientist like Sir John Eccles who says, because neuroscience can get very behavioral, you know, related to the activities of your brain field. And Sir John Eccles says, let us be fundamentally clear that mind is non-material that mind is non-material. You have a major neuroscientist heading us again in that direction of saying that there is something beyond matter, beyond any form of matter, however subtle and powerful it can, and that it's extremely potent force that we now call the origin of consciousness or higher mind. But you know, the, all the advances in consciousness research show that we are non-locally connected, that you know, at the quantum level, we are all one part of a piece of the same kind of soup. One scientist said, imagine you know, there is jello filling the universe, and you catch the jello, and it ripples all the way through the universe. That's how connected we all are. And, but we have also discovered in those aspects of neuroscience that are studying human consciousness as it relates to spirituality, empathy, compassion things like this, that there is a tremendous resonance with what the conscious activist, the spiritual activist, the heart servant would, would view as reality. So we know, for example, in neuroscience that we have something called mirror neurons and mirror neurons are extraordinary discovery in the last 15 years. Because a mirror neuron is a way in which something that is happening outside of you gets translated inside of you as if it were you. Very key line there. The mirror neuron, when you're watching a game of tennis, or your favorite sport. The reason it's so enjoyable is your mirror neurons are playing the game as if you were playing the game. The intersubjective reality, that you become the thing observed. And then there's a part of you that says, the noisy, judgmental part of you, no, that's not me. No, I'm terrible at tennis. No, I'm, I'm no good or whatever. But that's just one example. Another example is 
when we're in dialogue, we talked about those social healing dialogues, but any form of deep dialogue where you really open the field, the collective field, we can begin to measure the electromagnetic energy in the field. We can measure, you know, what's happening in the amygdala with the quieting of the brain. We can see the biochemistry of the body transforming in dialogue, starting to take out cortisol and put in, replace it with DHEA, which is open, radiant, inclusive. So now we have this map of you know, empathy and compassion and dialogue and there are certain aspects of science that are again saying this must be leading us to consciousness as the driver not you know it's a it's a material accident that you somehow have a brain that can think things and then we have one final example epigenetics we have genetics you know the material library that's handed down by nature through nature we are carriers of that library and material science can overplay its hand in terms of you know your genes will predispose you to this that and the other and it can be a heavy-handed approach to what is your destiny. And epigenetics is about the environment in which your genes exist, the environment of consciousness, your emotional center, your own belief system, that belief itself can drive and change the way the genes are functioning and the, the epigenetic environment is going to become much more the reality of our investigation in the future. So those are just a few areas in which there is dazzling and exciting convergence between what the mystic has known in experience and what the scientist is coming to corroborate. Uh, fantastic, thank you. Uh, thank you, James. That definitely um, sort of in my in my studies as well, which which are kind of in between the science and the mysticism and the sort of philosophical anthropological, um, the humanities has ha has this interesting term called the non-human turn. And uh, this is sort of a, an idea that they have that we start, we have to start paying attention to the whole planet and other organisms that are not human have agency and have consciousness. And they're, I'm just so interested that, you know, it's just becoming, um, no matter what field you're looking at, there's somebody talking about this, the kind of attempting to to encounter the other, to realize that there are others there, you know, um, to see agency behind things where we didn't before. Uh, and even in, uh, in philosophy and the humanities, there's this push now uh, for, for panpsychism, right? And this idea that mind is behind everything. And they're asking these previous, you know, previously materialist um, schools of thought and, and, and faculties are seriously asking the question, is, is mind behind everything? Is the world, is the universe minded? So it, I think you're absolutely right. There's, there's this kind of turning right now uh, towards this kind of connection with the universe in a way that we, we have sort of had a lot of trouble with before in a very materialist, mechanical-oriented culture and consciousness mm -hmm. uh, so it's very it's, it's very stimulating and exciting but it's also kind of a relief to know that finally people are starting to ask these questions and this is not just the 
this is not just in our incubators, you know, in, in the counterculture, in the in the Institute of Noetic Sciences, or in uh, Oroville, you know, these kinds of questions are kind of seeping behind everyone in the back of everyone's minds. Um, so I just find it really exhilarating, and I think you articulate it so beautifully. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we see if there are any questions? Yes. So we do have a few. Or comments. And yes, and I recommend everyone, uh, there is a Q&A box if you haven't already put your question in there. Uh, it's directly beneath the video box. It just says Q&A. And you can just click that, enter your question. And also you could send it in the chat box if that's easier for you. So uh, the first question is from Barbara. And Barbara says, um, and Barbara says, as you said, people are existing at all levels in this journey through evolution towards the shift towards responsibility to our nature, to nature herself. Um, on the one end, people are speaking of bombing as conflict resolution. And on the other end, people are embracing greater personal embodiment by healing the rifts between their natural self and their self-alienated self, usually acquired through acculturation and the traumatic pulling away from one's natural self as one adopts to toxic culture and family. And people healing themselves in this way usually have a totally different paradigm for collective conflict resolution than those who are working out their karma as within, so without. So how do, we, how do we bridge the divide between different levels of consciousness when it comes to social activism? Is the bridge somehow vulnerability to break the grip of polarized righteousness? So that's Barbara's question. Wow, Barbara, <laughs> that is a powerful statement. A lot of truth in there and a great, great question. I think it goes back to that haunting instruction about love your enemy and the esoteric practice that was recommended, which is to find the resonance, you know, in the so-called sinner or the so-called bad guy, because that's just you in another form of learning. And that's, to get to that truth, it's a huge place of enlightenment when you really understand how you are interrelated. But that finding of the lovable essence, somewhere in the essence of the one who is pushing you around, is distorting you, is aggravating you, is making you polar. I mean, don't you love that? That you, you try to live a non-polarizing life and then along comes the epitome of the thing that you want to castigate and drown in judgment pointing at how terrible it is. And it's caught you. It's like in the game of it, you know, like you just got it because you got judgmental, you got self -judgmental. And so it says in that practice, go to the place even in that energy, find it mysteriously, resonate with its truth, with its loveliness. And, and Neil Douglas Clark says in this practice, this is not an emotive practice, this is an ex esoteric subtle activist practice and I, I think that's a, a wonderful example and the, there is some element I've been playing with of late that hasn't fully revealed itself to me but it's about playing your part and maybe again Barbara as you talked about the self-alienated part you can't fully play your part if you're alienated from yourself, if you haven't opened up the conduits to the subconscious mind and seen graphically who and what you are, and that that's all right, because that's been part of your learning. You know, a dead end is a step in the right direction when you know it's a dead end. In fact, it's the beginning of the path. Wow. Um, 
Thank you, James. So the next question is from, uh, from Joseph. And Joseph asks, uh, says, greetings, James. I'm feeling that the heart of all you are sharing, both in word and in your presence, is the invitation for us humans to bring love to where love seems not possible. Our very survival as a species appears to require this deeper penetration of love into areas of self and other that currently host fear. <laughs> How do you understand what love is and what role of love and what is, what is the role of love in evolution's unfolding? No easy questions tonight. But no, not tonight. Thank you, Joseph, for a wonderful comment and for an impossible question. But Mayor Baba says some beautiful words. He says, love has to sp spring spontaneously from within. It is in no way susceptible to any form of forcing or coercion. But because it in its absolute nature, it is that freely, spontaneously arising force. It will spread from heart to heart until all beings experience it and we have created a new humanity. So love may be at the root of the entire cosmic game. Certainly, mystics have said that in the beyond state of God, there is this eruption of the question, who am I? What is my nature? How can I be known? And so it sets down into the whole evolutionary process to experience being known. And if you've ever been in love, which I'm sure you all have, there is that gorgeous feeling that you've been seen, that you've been known, that another being knows you, and that nobody has quite known you this way before you've, you've been fully seen and known, as fully as another being can see you. And I think that is such an invitation to go see other beings. I see you. You can't hide from me. You may cover yourself in snarly gnarly, but I know that in there you are exquisite and beautiful. And so it becomes, imagine the social process developing to a time and place where that is really the social capital. That is the true gold that is discovered. That is the ultimate sharing resource. And we just hunt and look for to be seen and known fully and to experience then the unitive state of attraction. I have lately realized, and that's why I made that comment about the dead ends, every path I've taken that hasn't been a path to the infinite has opened me to look at how all of those energies that get blocked or locked or misdirected are longing to go in one direction, to be one with the one and all, to be connected with the entire entirety, not just intellectually or philosophically, but experientially. And we know about love, you can talk about it as much as you like, but when you experience it, that's when you know it's love. You can, and that's, I think, our, my sense of the source of consciousness, of that journey, that involution journey, is that it's a journey of experience to the divine. Lovely. Thank you. 
Um, so we have another question from, this one's from Adrian, uh, kind of a poetic statement with a question. So thank you for that, Adrian. Um, so Adrian says, be danced by soul symphony as you serve and navigate our collective embracing departure. As we stumble into light, light-headed darkness, we derive what has to be brought to the earth community by finally being authentic us. And then he asks, so is there a coherent core of the map from that the fields, mysticism, science, and activism radiate from? And what are the building blocks of the legend of the map? It's an interesting question. Wow, <laughs> just wonderful sharings. This is a wonderful group. I'm so happy to participate with you. And I'm not sure how to answer this question, but to have the sense of, the legend would say, material dimension, gross plane, you know, where matter predominates. Matter is on its beginning, its journey of ascension. So anything that colors with, with matter. And then the second would be the subtle planes of existence and of which, if you want a metaphor, they represent an ocean and matter is simply one wave on that ocean. That's how tiny matter is. That's why the journey is incredible. I mean, I'd love to be back in the year 4000 or whatever, when people have evolved higher into these dimensions collectively, into the place of the subtle plane. And as I said before, we know that the, that the subtler it gets, the more powerful it gets. And then the mental plane, you know, no energy at all. You've passed through the, the material realms, the energetic realms, to the pure insight where nothing that can, there can be no conditioning of the mind, where no impressions, no karma can be created because anything like energy or matter just goes through it without a ripple because it's complete equanimity complete balance and then mapping the states beyond into you know what the buddhists refer to as nirvana the, the nothingness state and beyond that for the sufis the sufis say you know, they have this word fana which means to be annihilated in the divine vacuum space of total emptiness so you never create karma. And then beyond that, they have this word bhaka, which means to wake up in the divine self. So that would be there would be that would be the high, higher part of the mapping there. But I know your question deserves a longer answer. Uh, jo Joseph said a, a masterful response to an impossible question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there is, let's see, one or two more questions. Um, this one is from Tom Atley. And thanks for joining us, Tom. Thanks for being on, on uh, the webinar with us. I uh, really appreciate your work as well. Um, so do, do you, he asks, do you see patterns in the unfolding of physical slash biological evolution since the Big Bang, which can be instructive for activists today who recognize that they are evolution becoming conscious of itself and want to do a good job of it? After all, evolution is the great grandma, grandmama of all change processes. So our change efforts are, the fa are a facet of that but we can be more or less conscious of our evolutionary identity. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you, Tom. Also great respect for your work. And I think you said it actually. Yeah. 
you know, Pythagoras had a mystical school, wasn't just known for his mathematical principles, but he had a mystical school. And it is said that he could experience the field of his own becoming back to the plants, which plants he had been, which animals he had been, which men, which women, which rich, which poor. He had somehow, I guess, you know, we would say, if you believe in that, that he had this experience of the Akashic field and could tap into that whole thing. But I think even if we don't have that level of capability, that at least, you know, we could say, I probably spent one life as a Catholic and one as a Protestant and one as a Muslim and one as a Buddhist. I probably spent one lifetime, or many lifetimes, as a woman, as a man, as, and to almost try not to force it, but at least to resonate experientially with that truth so that you come through with a compassion that says for learning. Like this was my learning on the battlefield or in the homemaking or in giving birth. And that this organism that is unfolding through evolution is a learning one. And that as you were alluding to, Tom, we can contribute to that learning. That's amazing that we as individuals have a dynamic role to play. And it goes back to that recent preoccupation of mine. Am I playing my part? You know, and how, how do I learn what my part is, but somehow doing more to activate that little speck of of the entire evolutionary process, knowing that it can contribute. And it can contribute to things like world peace. I can't help it, but I feel world peace in my being. I feel the end of this nonsensical, you know, overfed economy, crazy, politicians, self-righteous, religious people, you know, all of which I have been learning through my own years of, of evolutionary process. There is something I experience as peace, that I am peace, and peace will be the inheritance of humanity. I think we're coming to our end here soon. If there's one quick question, we'll take it. I sure, want to sure. read a poem I wrote called, which is a call to action. And I think it integrates our conversation. It's called This Consecrated Hour. Please, um, actually, yeah, we've got one quick question. Would you wanna, want me to read that sure. and then we can do yeah. the, okay. Uh, so this one is, so it's by William and, and Bra Brahmi. Many people in the dream of our challenging and highly potent, potentized times speak of seeing the handwriting on the wall. What to you is the handwriting on the wall? I, what I see, as I was suggesting in the last answer, what I see is my own experience as as the vital guide. And what I see is I am becoming less theoretical, less abstractly intellectual. Not that there is, the intellect is very important, don't get me wrong, but that in my experience, there is something expanding 
like uh, you know, like the mycelial network in human consciousness that is more subtle than the current media can digest. So the current media becomes more and more gross, materialistic, doing its part of the learning process in many, many ways also. But this subtle plane of, of reality, like the mycelial network, is, is now reaching a fulcrum. And when it is seen and when its power really catalyzes and evolution says, learned enough, here we go, something is going to pop. I think, I think of us as the first crocuses of a new springtime for humanity. And I can say that with some at least authority, that I've been to places of hell on earth. I have spent years and years on torture, murder, political murder, executions, disappearances, massacres. I have at least some credibility to say, I've walked through that horrid, terrible human learning, and I experience peace, optimism, hope, and the electricity, the fire of what is brewing in the human heart and soul. I think we are collectively deeply fed up with the trivia of our destiny path at the moment and the insanity with which it is created. I think we're deeply fed up and, and that we have the juice. We have some way of contacting something more essential that will unfold before our very eyes. And so I'd like to read you this poem. It is, I believe, an accurate reflection of our time. <clears throat> it's called This Consecrated Hour. There's a copy of it on a PDF on my website, jamesod.com. And there's also an audio version, and we're going to do a graphic video version of this also. Do you not see them, the ashen ones, the gray ones, the starving orphans, the seduced innocents, the decimated specters of conflagration, all the beings trampled in degradation, crowding our collective shadow field. Go find them in this, this consecrated hour of human becoming. Find your estranged, your lost and abandoned family and embrace them into the vital marrow of your life. Kiss them until the ashes of their betrayal turn from gray to red and the blush of love blows through the one soul, the one life of all. Do you not feel them, the slicks of poison, the necrotic plastic, the ocean's dead zones, the cancers, the tumors, the die-offs, the daily extinctions, the breath of life suffocated on a genocidal scale? Do you not feel them in your own flesh and blood? Go heal the pain in this this consecrated hour of human becoming, feel your rivers, your lakes, your mountains, feel their freshness, their pure life force, coursing your veins, opening your heart to the one mother, the one soul, the one life of all. And finally, do you not know them the guardians of the moment, the secret listeners, the agents of truth, the instruments of soul awakening, consciousness raising, 
light resurrecting, power of transfiguration in the center of your own compassionately ripened awareness. Go manifest this power in this, this consecrated hour of human becoming. Sing the communal choirs of collaboration, showering our wounded world with the divinely fated audacity to celebrate the one soul, the one life of all. Thank you, James. That was uh, beautiful and uh, profound. And thank you for joining us tonight as well. And in many ways, um, <clears throat> opening the space, not just this webinar, but Nora and uh, Nora Learning. Uh, I think having you on as, as the opening note and the opening silence, uh, the opening space is, um, I'm just deeply grateful for it. And uh, I'm very appreciative of what you brought here and what you kind of opened up for us here in your work. So. Well, thank you for the quality of who you are. I really bless your endeavor. It's a tremendously good one for neuro learning's integral pathway. Thanks for the wonderful questions from you and from our community here tonight. And we go onward. Onward indeed. So um, everybody, uh, the recording will be made available if you missed anything. And uh, that should be in about 48 hours. I'm going to just edit everything and get the transcript ready. And um, thank you again so much, everybody, uh, for joining us today in our, in our inaugural session. And thank you, James. Uh, we'll be in touch. And, thank uh, you, Jeremy. Yes. Bye -bye. Good night, everyone.